It's Friday, November 10th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. It is a hell of a day to talk ball and joining me to do just that for the preview episode is the one and only Scott Pianowski. Scott, what's going on, buddy? Not much. It's a great day to talk ball. Week 10, some major teams on by fantasy managers trying to lock up playoff spots, trying to get buys, um, a lot of unusualness in the NFL with the quarterbacks, guys who can't play right now, guys who are hurt, guys who are changing teams. It's a great day to talk ball. Let's do it. A pristine day to talk ball, some people would say. I'm with you, Scott, that at first I was like, oh, this is going to be a dicey preview episode with all the quarterback weirdness like you mentioned. We have three uh, big-time quarterbacks on by this week between Tua and Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes, but Actually, you know what? I looked at the Week 10 schedule, and I felt really good about a lot of these games. So let's talk about some of those games. Reminder for how we do this here on the Weekly Viewer's Guide episode. We give you the games you want to binge, stream, and skip. Well, what the hell does that mean if you're new? It's kind of, again, like streaming culture. You know, the, the, the video apps, all that type of stuff out there. The binge games, those are the shows you can't miss. You're watching them as soon as they come out. You might just crush them all in one weekend. The games you want to stream. Those are the shows, the games you certainly want to watch start to finish, but you know, you might take a few weeks to finish those, but you really, really do like them. And the games you want to skip, I think that kind of speaks for itself. You're not really trying to watch that. There's really not a ton to say about it, but we'll try to give you something useful out of all those skip games as well. So with that, let's dive into the week 10 viewers guide and let's talk about the games we want to binge this weekend here in week 10, starting with San Francisco 49ers. Uh, minus three, three point favorites going to Jacksonville, 45 and a half point over under, uh, both these teams are coming off their buy Scott. And I find both of them in very interesting places right now. Uh, what do you got on this game? Yeah. You, you mentioned the key point that they're both off the buy. And I always feel like the game after that week off is a reveal. What is the second half plan and teams have to fix what isn't working. The Niners are on a three game losing streak. The Jaguars, Trevor Lawrence doesn't have a 19-point game in fantasy this year, which blows my mind. Calvin Ridley, after a fast start, has been inconsistent and has been usurped for fantasy value by Christian Kirk on his own team, as you know more than anybody. They play different positions, different types of wide receivers. So Kyle Shanahan's been cooking. Doug Peterson's been cooking, and this game should reveal, is Calvin Ridley going to be in the circle of trust? I, very interesting thing about the Niners to me. Baltimore and San Francisco are the only two teams in the NFL right now that run more than they pass. They're ever so slightly run heavy and you can get away with it for fantasy with their with the San Francisco receivers, maybe not the Baltimore receivers because it's been such an efficient offense. But I wonder if that ratio is going to change or not. I don't feel as great as I, Ayuk makes me a little bit nervous. Debo makes me a little bit nervous. The Niners should be a more fun team. Here's the bottom line with this, with this game, with these teams. I feel like, oh, it's a Niners game. Oh, it's a Jaguars game. It should be a fantasy bonanza. You know, the total should be 52. It should be first team to 30. Well, the total's 45 and a half. As I mentioned, Lawrence hasn't had a great season. Ridley's been inconsistent. The Niners make me a little bit nervous given their star power. So I'm, I'm hoping they hit the ground running after the bye. But this is the big reveal game for me in week 10. I love that. It's a perfect way of saying it because it's not necessarily like a fantasy bonanza, but it's one of the games I, I want to just be like ISOed on. I want to really be dialed in on what this, how this game unfolds. I'm definitely going to rewatch it, you know, on film afterwards, right? It's one of those type of games because I think we're going to learn a lot about these two teams. It's kind of like a critical juncture in both of their seasons. Sticking on Jacksonville before we talk San Francisco here, I saw you tweeted uh, today that Josh Dobbs, Shout out to Josh Dobbs has cleared 20 fantasy points in four games this year, whereas Trevor Lawrence hasn't done it once all season, which kind of blew my mind because I, I think Lawrence has played really well. And I know he's been a fantasy disappointment. I mean, he is a constant staple in the people's panic mirror episode that Andy and I do to start the week. So people are always upset about Trevor Lawrence, but just didn't dawn on me. He hasn't even cleared 20 points once all year. It's pretty wild. This particular defense I think it's kind of, you know, we focus obviously so much on offense and people talk about Brock Purdy all the time, but really this like three game skid going into their bye for San Francisco has been very defense related. I think, you know, Steve Wilkes is going to be on the sideline now. He's not going to be up in the booth. I'm curious as to what uh, effect they think that's going to have, but clearly there's a reason that they're doing it right. Um, D'Amico Ryans was always a down on the sideline guy for San Francisco, and you could tell in previous the previous two seasons they really fed off that energy and i mean steve wilkes 
I know I'm talking like narratives here, but Steve Wilkes is a big energy guy. Um, you know, his time as the Carolina Panthers interim head coach, that was a big part of why that team sort of surged to the end of the season was because of the energy that Steve Wilkes provides. So maybe that brings the 49ers defense something. We shall see. They do play uh, two single high defense at the uh, second highest rate in the NFL. The, the Baltimore Ravens are the only other team that play more single high defenses. Typically, we see that lean towards the number one outside receiver in terms of like targets per route run and yards per route run. Uh, so maybe this is a get right spot for Calvin Ridley, but it's sort of as much as we're going to talk about these, these uh, opposing offenses. I really think the 49ers defense might be one of the most interesting units to watch in this game. For sure. And let's just put a period on the Lawrence discussion. He had five rushing touchdowns last year. He doesn't have a single rushing touchdown this year and his touchdown rate is down from last year. He, most of his efficiency numbers are very similar to last season. And I understand that can make people a little bit anxious because he, you know, the rookie year, you know, the coaching staff was a joke and everything. I mean, you, Urban Meyer just shouldn't have been an NFL coach. We've talked about that a million times. So last year, Lawrence takes a step forward and people want to be like a plane taking off where it gets a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And next thing you know, you're at 20,000, 50,000 feet or whatever. When somebody has a season that's maybe more stuck in neutral, especially when you added a piece like Calvin Ridley, it can make people anxious because like, well, wait a minute, this yeah. how come this plane isn't taking off? How, how come we're at the same level? What's going on here? Uh, it's supposed to be wheels up time for Trevor Lawrence. I would not be at all surprised if they finish with a great second half. And again, I talk about this being a reveal game, but part of this is just touchdown regression. I, I also put a post up and I'll talk about it with the Ravens and some other teams, just teams that are out of whack with their touchdown ratios from rushing to passing and it feels like the jaguars have been a little bit unlucky with their passing touchdowns and that's the type of thing that can iron itself out quietly at any point in time yeah that's a great point and etn i'm curious to see his usage coming out of the bye because he had 30 opportunities the game before the bye 24 carries against the pittsburgh steelers and six targets and played a season high 89 percent of the snaps i mean he's been very good for them, but their run game hasn't been super consistent from a success rate standpoint. And I think they didn't really want Travis Etienne to be this type of bell cow back. I think they wanted to be a committee, but their other alternatives, most notably rookie Tank Bigsby, has not they've not been good enough to get Etienne off the field. So interested to see if that holds up and and if that run pass touchdown uh rate does tend to balance out. Last thing on this game, just the 49ers side here. They're such a hard team to talk about from a fantasy standpoint because it's like, you know what you should do? You should probably just start everybody and, and like keep it moving and, and you accept the big games when they come. Um, but just like from a Brock Purdy standpoint, where is your temperature check on Brock Purdy right now? I was just going to ask you the same question. I mean, he, w- he was like a kind of a sleeper MVP candidate for the first month of the season. He's taken a step back, but you know, the, the Minnesota game probably concussed in that game. He made a couple of throws late in the game. I, I just don't think should be on his record for practical purposes. He reminds me of this is gonna sound like a knock, but I'm not knocking him. Like a really good version of what Brad Johnson was, or maybe a, the better Andy Dalton at his peak, which which could go to a Pro Bowl, could drive you to a to a Super Bowl to uh to a playoff appearance. Of course, Andy Dalton never won playoff games, but I think he can be a plus quarterback. I mean, maybe he can be Kirk Cousins. He's not as physically gifted as Cousins. Obviously, Cousins is hurt right now. But I, I, the bottom line is if you have to make it binary, are you in or out on Brock Purdy? I'm still in on Brock Purdy. I think he, what he did during this losing streak is somewhat of an excused absence. Same. I think if you had to put it in on a binary standpoint, I think I'm still in um, on Brock Purdy. I think the extreme positive takes on Brock Purdy to start the season were ridiculous. And I think the extreme negative analysis of Brock Purdy the last three games has also been equally ridiculous. So I'm somewhere in the middle here where usually the truth almost always lies anyways. If you want to talk like a matchup note on this particular game, we have seen over the years that when teams play a lot of man coverage, Brandon Ayuk tends to go off. When they play a lot of zone coverage, Debo Samuel tends to go off and That really sometimes it doesn't always work, I think, with the player's skill set. But I think this this one really does, because if you just look at like these guys and reception perception, uh, Brandon Ayuk's been a great man beater and Debo's been historically one of the best zone beaters in the NFL since he came into the year and is not that great against man coverage. And the Jacksonville Jaguars, according to fantasy points, data coverage metric uh, or matrix. They play zone coverage at the fourth highest rate. So maybe this is a big Debo returns off the bye, fully healthy type of game. 
And it makes sense too, right? The defense is playing back. They're playing a little more passive. Debo gets the ball underneath, not because of his route running or anything like that, but he's in space. He can break tackles after the catch. So uh, maybe this is a good week to look at Debo Samuel overs and potentially just make him a very confident like wide receiver two, high end wide receiver two for your fantasy team. All right, let's move on to the next game here. Houston Texans at Cincinnati Bengals. Bengals are six and a half point favorites over under a 47. So many exciting uh, things to talk about in this game, Scott. Uh, but I do want to start a little negative here. Uh, Cincinnati Bengals have I- issues at the wide receiver position. Uh, Chris Collinsworth called it out in real time on Sunday night that like, oh, yeah, Jamar Chase is going to have uh, he- he's going to. He's going to be lucky to like he's going to be crawling out of bed, I think is what he said, right? Um, and then he sounded like a guy who had crawled out of bed when he was like, I'm just thankful I'm alive, right? The next day uh, when he was talking to the media. So he's got a back issue right now. T. Higgins pulled a hamstring in practice. Um, so let's live in a hypothetical negative world real quick. We were all excited about Joe Burrow. People can't say Joe Burrow is back enough. But if Burrow is dealing with a hampered wide receiver room. Maybe one or both of these guys, knock on wood, doesn't play in this game. How are we feeling about the Bengals in this particular spot? Uh, you have to back off if he's missing both of them. If if Chase can go, I'm not going to change my Burrow rank. And I'm just like everybody else. This is not a unique take, but Burrow, what is it? 10 touchdowns, two interceptions the last two weeks. He's beaten the Bills. He's beaten the Niners. He's beaten the Seahawks. Those are all playoff teams. He also had Arizona win in there. I think Burrow is like a sneaky MVP candidate right now and a good value somewhere like eight to 10 to one somewhere in there, because if he finishes the season strong, the voters are going to give him a pass for playing hurt early in the season, that rain game at Cleveland, you know, play, play Cleveland and Baltimore the first two weeks. By, by the way, we'll get to that game in a minute. The two best defenses in the NFL and you play them when you're not healthy, total excused absence. So I think Burrow, all the all the Burrow hype, all the Burrow bandwagoning, I'm here for it. But he needs – this is not a deep receiver room after those two guys. Yeah. Tyler Boyd's not a bad player. Irwin's not a bad player. But you don't want those guys to be starters, not at this point of Boyd's career. They don't have a tight end of any major you – know, Joe Mixon's a good player but not really a needle mover. They need these receivers to for Burrow to be the player we want him to be. So, unfortunately, I <laughs> – I know a lot of Burrow managers would probably start him no matter what, but if he's missing both of these guys, I think you really need to think of a change. If Chase goes, I'll just whistle through the graveyard and say Burrow will be fine. Tyler Boyd actually has <laughs> – he has gone over 70 yards receiving twice mm. in the last two seasons. One of them was an Atlanta Falcons game where they won 35-17, to 17, and that wasn't even like a, oh, one of those guys missed. Both T. Higgins and Jamar Chase played – in that game, uh, T. Higgins had 95 yards. Jamar Chase had two touchdowns and 130 yards. The other game he all, that he went over 70 yards, he also went over 100 yards. That was against the Jets in week four last year. And again, T. Higgins played in that game. Jamar Chase played in that game. So there really hasn't been like a like, oh, yep, one of those guys goes out. Mm. Tyler Boyd immediately shoots up to the moon and. The depth beyond those guys, like Charlie Jones is a prospect I liked, but, you know, he flashed in the preseason, but that's kind of a long shot. The tight ends popped up last week, but I, you know, somebody's asked me, like, maybe the tight ends, is he a guy, is there a guy there? But they're not playing enough to confidently play any of those guys. So really there isn't even like a, oh man, these two transformative talents get pushed to the bench and somebody else jumps up here. You're so right. I, we've often, I've, I've done this the last couple of years, maybe not this year, but the year prior. Oh, Tyler Boyd, here's a pivot because one of the guys in front of him isn't playing and Boyd's come up so small in those spots. And I, mean, I don't want to knock the guy. He, he had a nice career. You know, he had the classic third-year breakout, which feels like an antiquated theory now. But you know, he didn't do much his first two years. He goes over 1,000 his third year, goes over 1,000 his fourth year, was a nice player at peak, was probably a really solid wide receiver too for a couple of seasons. But now – I don't even think he's a stash. I don't even think there's contingent upside here. Like say no. Higgins or Chase, I nobody wants to say this, but say they needed to miss a lot of time. As much as I love Burrow, I just don't see a ceiling for Tyler Boyd. So I don't this is a time where you're trying to look for who can I roster, who might I be playing in a month from now, who I'm not using now. I don't even put Tyler Boyd in that conversation. But hopefully, I, I am optimistic that Higgins and Chase will both go. And that means that you know, the, the, the triplets are back together, the band is back together, and the Bengals can be one of what we thought they would be one of the five best offenses in football. 
Uh, I think it would be if these receivers miss time. I think it would be a pretty Joe Mixon heavy game, which nobody Oof. like gets excited about Joe Mixon at this point. Um, but at the same time, the Texans, they're ninth in rush rushing success rate allowed. But I bet if there's no Jamar Chase and or T Higgins, like they get under center a lot. And Joe Mixon runs much better under center than from shotgun uh, Houston Texans side of this thing. I mean, look, CJ Stroud's the talk of the NFL right now. He should be the talk of the NFL right now. And like, I'm it, while that is the case, while he's playing like this, I think he's a fantasy starter. I think Tank Dell's a fantasy starter. I think Nico Collins is a fantasy starter. I think Dalton Schultz is a fantasy starter. Um, and then I'm not really messing around with the backfield. Any any different takes there? Pretty much, I co-signed everything you said with the addition of if you need to dig deep, a lot of good receivers aren't playing this week, right? You know the the Vikings, not the Vikings, the, the Rams have two guys. Miami has two guys. Philly has two guys. Um, Rasheed Rice and a cast of thousands. The Chiefs in Kansas have City. seven guys that yeah. do, that nobody. Yeah. The wants Chiefs to have play. twenty-seven guys, and one of them who we we kind of <laughs> like, and that's about it. Fine. So you might need to go to Noah Brown, who came out of nowhere last week, has has a game that he's not going to repeat. I get it. But this passing game is concentrated to four guys. Collins has been in the circle trust all year. When Dell's been healthy, he's been the same. Dalton Schultz is a solid tight end. And the tight end position has made a nice comeback. Maybe it's because they gave them that made-up holiday of you know tight end day or whatever a couple of weeks ago. But it feels like that position has had a lot more buoyancy lately. And Dalton Schultz has been part of that story. But C.J. Stroud, we love it. Why don't we love Arthur Smith? Because he doesn't prioritize his best players. Why do we love C.J. Stroud? Because he's like, okay, I got three or four really good receivers. I'll throw the ball to them. And the team, it's mostly the, most of their touchdowns have come through the air. They've had trouble running the ball, even with the backfield ostensibly to himself last week. Devin Singletary didn't do anything. We know the Houston Texans offensive line is a problem. You can mask that easier in the passing game, although it's just miraculous that Stroud – I can't tell you anything about Stroud that everybody else isn't saying you haven't heard already. I mean, he should have been the first pick. He's been incredible. And it's just fun to watch. Burrow still feels kind of like the new kid in the block. I know he came in the NFL at an advanced age. He transferred in college and all that stuff. But Burrow is still kind of a, a newer superstar in the league. This is obviously Stroud's first season. It's exciting to see them go head-to-head in this game and they don't play against each other. It's not how football works, but... Uh, I'm going to play total is 47. I'm going to play a lot of these Texans guys proactively. Collins, Dell easily. Schultz fairly easily. And even Noah Brown, if you have to go deep. I think it's going to be another Devin Singletary 14 touch, 37 yards, no touchdown game. Keep an eye on Robert Woods, who did return to practice today. So he could uh, he could upset the uh, Noah Brown party here. But sure. I do. But um, I love what you're saying about the tight ends. Like, hey. When has a fake holiday not boosted everybody's spirits? I mean, come on, workplaces do that all. I'm the time. all about it's the like, I'm all about the fake holiday, man. Yeah. So hey, hey, if the tight ends can get rolling off fake tight end day, then I'm I'm all for it. All right, next game up here: Cleveland Browns at Baltimore Ravens. Ravens are six point favorites. The over under is thirty eight and a half. Um, it's probably not going to be a big fantasy day. Okay, these are the two best defenses in the NFL, but you can't not put this game in the in the in the binge category, right? Because look. Browns are very fascinating to talk about. I know their offense is 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 kind of boring, and like, when is Deshaun Watson going to show up? But that defense is great. The Ravens might be the best team in the NFL, and I still think Scott, there's meat left on the bone on that offense. And I'm curious your your thoughts on the passing touchdown stuff here, because man, I I think there's a lot of upside still in that passing game in Baltimore, which is crazy to say, because again, like consensus wise, they might be the best team in the NFL right now. I, I agree with that. I do think they're the best team in the NFL, but they're a very difficult fantasy team to unpack. So the Ravens, 17 rushing touchdowns. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, 17 rushing touchdowns against 10 passing touchdowns. That's the heaviest slant towards run running touchdowns in the NFL. Most of the teams in the league have more passing touchdowns than rushing touchdowns. There's only a handful of teams that have more rushing touchdowns. I tweeted that earlier today, so you can check that out on my feed if you want to look deeper into that. And even, so you might say, okay, well, great. Well, Baltimore's dynamic running the ball, but even that's complicated because Gus Edwards is going to get some of the touchdowns. Obviously, Jackson's going to get some of the touchdowns. Keaton Mitchell gets on the field and is shot out of a cannon, 9 for 138 last week. He was terrific. Justice Hill's going to have a role. So if you told me, Matt, if I decided to just go, I don't know, to Tibet for four months, I'm just going to skip the first couple months of the NFL season, and you tap, you you text me, you say, "Hey, the Ravens are the best team in football." It's um, early November. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, who's going to the moon? Lamar Jackson. Well, he's been good, not great. Oh, uh, J.K. Dobbins, right? Well, he got hurt week one. Okay, Gus Edwards. Well, yeah, he's been good. But Trey Flowers, yeah, 
last week, one catch. I they have a lot of receivers. They their usage is very spread out. I feel like for a team that's playing is they're easily the highest point differential in the NFL. They are the consensus number one team. They have a great defense, as you said. These are the two best defenses. They own the NFC. I, I guess you don't get a look at the Ravens regularly, and maybe they're a very difficult matchup. Browns, of course, play them twice a year. I just felt like if the Browns were going to be the best team in football, it would be a little bit more fantasy friendly than it's been so far. No, I, I'm with you. And like this receiving room, Zay Flowers has a 24% air yard share. He's a 23.4% target share. Those lead the team. But that doesn't indicate that like he's do- like that he's dominating targets. Cause like you said, they're pretty spread out. Like Nelson Aguilar is more in the mix than anybody would have expected. And I, I don't even think Aguilar has been bad this year. I mean, he's he's Nelson Aguilar, which isn't surprising, but he just is what he is. That said, there's kind of a narrative right now around Zay Flowers that like, oh, because of his usage, he's he's not beating NFL cornerbacks. Like he's not winning down on downfield routes. That could not be farther from the truth when you watch him play. Like this guy gets open on big boy routes, just they haven't used him there. I got to think that at some point the Ravens coaching staff sees what I'm seeing when I watch the player and they start to kind of use him more in that way because there's no reason that he hasn't been. Um, And I know you, you, maybe you want to make fun of me for this and, and plenty of people probably would, but Rashad Bateman has started to look a lot better of lately. Scott, Scott, if you, if you're just listening to the show, you're not watching on YouTube, Scott is smirking and like nodding his head and like, here goes Harmon keeping the candle lit when he probably should just blow it out. But I'm telling you, Scotty, he's looking like, a more functional NFL player right now than he was. And I don't think he's about to turn into a a fantasy star or anything, but I think it just goes to the point that like there is meat left on this bone, on this bone in this passing game. And like if Zay gets started to use in more a full field type of way, because I think he could be that player and Bateman starts to get back to like functional NFL starter level. Like maybe that's what takes Lamar Jackson from um, the atmosphere to the moon in fantasy. You know, I I don't want to, be a, a killjoy about this game for fantasy purposes. The total is 38 and a half. I don't think they're going to get to it. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm kind of with you. Because uh, Baltimore, as we said, they've been run heavy. They have different guys who can run, different guys who have different skill sets. Jackson's always going to be a proactive runner. And we never know what Deshaun Watson's going to do. I mean, last week he gets that lucky helmet touchdown to Amari Cooper. And Cooper's a guy, I, I'll give him credit. I mean, when I least expect it, Cooper seems to have a big game. He, he's done it with backup quarterbacks at times. He's done it with Watson at times. I, the touchdown was a fluke. He's played Amar- so well this year. He's played so, he's so well. He's a good player. At, at, and he's at an age where you start getting nervous about guys. And it's been, uh, in a lot of ways, the year of the old player. And I, I guess maybe Cooper's on the on the periphery of that. You know, Maybe he's not at an age where we worry about him yet, but he's getting close to that point. Well, he he came into the league at like seemingly nineteen years old. He's right. he's been in the league forever, but he's only twenty. He's like the youngest twenty nine year old of all time. Well said. And man, what a weird year it's been for Alabama receivers. We could do a podcast separate on on itself. And he was the first of that wave, right? The Ooh, guys after good, him. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a like really that. fun maybe for the off season where we're, we're trying to come up with some different topics. But I'm I'm just afraid the Browns I love their defense. Jim Schwartz has been amazing. The talent that they all three levels they have playmakers. It, it's not just the big guys, but I'm afraid the Browns could score six points in any week. And this this looks this looks like a game where it's going to get to halftime before every other game, right? They're going to be you watch your runs oh, yeah. of oh the the Ravens and Browns have already gone to half. Justin Tucker just made a 52 yard field goal. It's Baltimore 10, Cleveland three. You know, I, I just not going to be a lot of scoring here. The Browns need to make this an ugly game, and they're going to. And can you trust any of their running backs? I don't trust Watson. I this is going to this is going to be if to the people who say. Oh, the NFL. It's all about offense. It's illegal to play defense. And you know, it's they make everything so easy for the quarterbacks and you can't breathe on the receivers. The people who want to see football played the way it was played a generation or two ago, this is your game because this is going to be a slobber knocker. This is going to be like a lot like the, the Steelers and Ravens yeah. have games like this a lot where it's like the 13 to 10, 16 to 13 game. This is exactly what you're going to get from the Browns and Ravens this week. Yeah, this is your game. I can't say enough about that Ravens pass defense. Uh, they just swallowed up a really good uh, Seattle Seahawks receiving core last week. Like people were just not open in that game, and those guys get open routinely. You've got me really distracted now on like an off season podcast idea of like, you know, because Alabama and Ohio State mm-hmm. like are wide receiver you, and you could argue that both of those like it's been a really weird year for Alabama receivers. Like you said, 
Ohio State's had a weird year in terms of receivers, right? Like JSN hasn't got it, gotten off and running necessarily. Chris Olave's had a weird year. Garrett Wilson gets thrown asunder back with Zach Wilson immediately. Terry McLaurin seems to have a weird year every year because he plays with the weirdest quarterbacks ever. And like Michael Thomas has maybe had the weirdest career of all time for a wide receiver room. So that you put, put a pin in that uh, for offseason podcast ideas. Um, last thing on this game, and we'll move on. Rubber meets the road. Keaton Mitchell start or sit in week uh, number 10 here? You start him, but it's going to be seven to 10 touches. You, yeah. He has a hope he makes one big play. And you mentioned that Baltimore pass defense being so good. It, a, bit, a huge part of that is the Ravens can get a pass rush without devoting a lot of people to it. And a lot of times a team will max protect and the Ravens will still beat it with some of the games they run up front. It's It's a really fun defense to watch. Uh, Colin, producer Colin asked in the chat, like, what if you have Gus Bus in, in addition to Keaton Mitchell? Colin, I'm going to say this to you, and I'm going to say this to all the people that do this to themselves. Stop doing this, okay? Stop having two running backs from the same team. You're, you are guaranteed, you're just, you're guaranteeing, you're locking it in that you're going to make your life miserable. Yeah, because he has the two of the Lions backs on the same team. Colin, you're, you're out of your damn mind, okay? Dave, as Dave Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs on the same team. I had somebody tweeted me today like, oh, I have Tyler Algier and, and B. John Robinson on the same team. Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you do Because if one of those guys hits, the other is not going to hit. Like it's a, Or at least they're not going to hit to the same level that they could if you didn't, like if the other guy doesn't, doesn't exist or the other guy misses time. Because like, oh boy, you've gotten a couple of good weeks out of Jameer Gibbs. Well, yeah. Well, I wonder why. Because the other guy was hurt. Like <laughs> never do this to yourself. Never do this to yourself. And if you do, I found myself in a fantasy hockey league where it's a, it's a, I'm not going to give you the details, bore you with that, but fantasy hockey talk on this show to begin with. But you shouldn't have multiple players on the same team play the same position. I had two players on the Minnesota team because one of them was hurt. The best pickup was one of the other guys. So I went around the league and thought, okay, does anybody else have this same situation? Did they have two forwards on the same team? Jeff Erickson had two forwards on New Jersey. And very conveniently, all four players were about the same talent level. So I just said to Jeff, look, I should get more diversity. You should get more diversity. Which Minnesota guys you want? Which New Jersey guy you want to trade for me? They're all about even. We get a trade done in like two or three minutes. Fantasy football is a much different game. But if you find yourself in that position, Matt's outlined, and I agree, you don't want to be in that position. Look around the league. Most of the time, Trades get done for two reasons. One, because people have depth and it's easy to make a trade. It's like trading baseball cards. Oh, I have doubles of this guy. I'll trade it for that guy. Fine. Or people make desperation trades. There's a big controversy in the day of Damashek, Bill Simmons, Fantasy Football League. Damashek made a trade with a guy who was in bye week hell. It probably made Damashek's team better in the long run, but that guy needed to win right now. Right. And so trade deadline's coming up soon in Yahoo. I know uh, Salvitri, who's joined the Yahoo team this year, does a lot of great trade advice and he's on the uh, the show every week and um, he's giving you great tips on how to manage that market because it's all about perception a lot a lot of the time what what does the market think about this this player that player but if you find yourself in a position where you're you're doubled up don't do that that's bunting in baseball it's playing for the small inning you want to play for the big inning i know later in the season maybe there are certain assets i would protect yes. with a backup but generally speaking you don't want to be doubled up at a position on the same team it's a losing strategy hundred percent. Yeah. That will change when we get to like playoff time. It's like, now we're going to tell you stash all those backup running backs. Doesn't sure. just be your team's backup running back. But right now, week 10, we're trying to get some wins. Uh, these two teams, next two teams we're going to talk about here, Detroit Lions, three point favorites going to LA to take on the Chargers, 48 and a half point over under. These two teams need to get a win, Scott. Um, these two teams, especially LA needs to keep it up to get in the AFC playoff race. But let's stick on those lines for a sec. We just talked about the running backs. Dave Montgomery could play in this game. If he does play in this game, what does the split look like between Montgomery and Gibbs? Because I thought Dan Campbell's con uh, comments about that this week in the press conference were notable. Right. He's hinting towards 50-50, and I think this is a team not every team in the NFL tells us the truth. You know, it, it was just so nice, like when, when the Packers said, Aaron Jones is ready to go, and he was, and they unleashed him. You know, That was teams nice. Most teams don't even want to admit, you know, Arthur Smith doesn't want to admit the Falcons are playing a game this week. It's like, oh, okay, you, you genius, you figure it out. You know, I, I'm so sick of Arthur Smith. But <laughs> did you, good, how, how many of the five and a half minutes did you, that it, where he explained why B. John Robinson doesn't get red zone work, did you listen to? I, I mean, just the, the 30 second clips I caught here and there. I'm, I'm not actively seeking out Arthur Smith's content because it just makes guy. me mad. Smart guy. We'll, 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 we'll 
we'll pile on him in a minute. I'll probably get flagged <laughs> for a personal foul, but later on, I tell you what, later in the show, much later. I think there's more Lions backfield stress than there needs to be because here's the thing: it's only two guys. It's a plus offense. It's probably the best offensive line in football. It's pretty darn close to it if it is. And it's an offensive coordinator we like. Ben Johnson headed probably towards a head coaching job next year. That's enough. There's enough to go around. They can both catch it. They can both run it. You know, maybe Gibbs needs to get more lucky to get a touchdown because when they're in close, it's probably Montgomery area, although Montgomery has been hurt a couple times. So we don't know if he can play the rest of the season unimpeded, but they're both startable. And I don't feel bad for, for the guy who's like, oh, I had Gibbs. He was going off. Now Montgomery's back. So what? Uh, Gibbs is going to get 14 touches in this game, 15, 16 touches, something like that. I There's enough work for both of them. The, the Lions offense is pretty fantasy friendly. It, Goff's good enough. They play indoors at home. Most of their schedule is indoors. This is a game, obviously, weather won't factor in. The, the 18 Chargers fans won't bother them. We know where the ball's going every week. St. Brown's like a perfect fantasy guy, right? Because he gets seven, eight targets to start with. And if the game falls right, he'll get 14 to 15. He might get like 18 to 20 in a right week. Laporte is a tight end who broke the rookie rules. They have good support receivers. I don't think any of them are startable now. Reynolds, DPJ, Jamison Williams, they're, they're all – I'm not even sure any of them are really stashable. I mean, D, DPJ just joined a new team. You have to have low expectations there. Reynolds hasn't done much lately. But St. Brown's such an easy start. I would love to play Gibbs or Montgomery anywhere I could. Goff's a top 10 quarterback. Laporte is probably a top five tight end. I actually think the Lions are going to beat the Chargers pretty easily. The Chargers did very little right in that Jets game. The Jets kind of said, we don't want this game. You can have it. But the Chargers offense didn't play well. And no, the Jets defense is very good. It's better than the Lions defense. But the Lions defense has been a lot better this year. It's improved. They have a decent pass rush. This looks like Lions 27, Chargers 13 to me. I co-sign basically everything you said about the Lions there. Um, kind of co-sign everything you said about them beating the, the Chargers there too, because like this offense is in in rough shape, man. I mean, I don't I don't want to be mean, but they're playing with ten guys on offense right now because Mike Williams is out, Josh Palmer's on IR, and he might not play again this season. Like Quinton Johnson is just like, like I said, they're playing with ten guys on offense right now. Like I don't, I don't want to be mean, but that's where that's where they're at. With that particular player and and how he has performed so far, maybe it at changes. least he played. But he played more Monday. Is there? Could you? Well, they don't have a choice. They don't right. have a choice. But could you squint? Could you squint and see him stashable or not even bother? I uh, I mean, you can you can stash him and like hope that what I just said is like not what I said is not true. Like that that eventually he develops. But he just what he has shown on an individual level is just it's next to nothing. Like, I mean, it is, it is pretty bad. I hate, I hate to say these names, but because most of the time when guys go early in the draft at receiver in recent years, there's been so many hits, but you get an Akil Harry here, you get a Jalen Rager there. I'm, I'm just worried that maybe it's going to be like, we're going to look back in a few years. Like, oh yeah. Quentin Johnston, you know, well, a third or fourth round pick. No, he went in the first round. <laughs> it's yeah. like, like, like Jalen Rager went for four, Justin Jefferson. We'll never be able to unpack that. You know, my, my oh. angst about, all the players the Patriots could have drafted instead of Nikhil Harry, although who's to say the Patriots would have actually gotten a lot out of some of those guys. But what a great receiver draft that was, and they took totally the wrong guy. Quentin Johnson's going to go down. because I, I still think N- N- Jigman's going to get there, and we'll get to that game in a second, which looks like a fun game. But yeah, I don't I don't think Johnson is stashable right now either. And that's, that's a hot take. I think probably everybody's in agreement on that. All right, next game up here, final one of the binge category. And Colin, uh, actually, producer Colin, advocated for this one in the binge mm. category i initially Good. had it in stream Good watch the commanders at seattle seahawks seahawks are six point favorites 44 and a half over under looks like a great bounce back spot for that seahawks passing uh attack that got bodied last week scott uh against the commander's defense that can't really cover anybody and and dude sam howell is like a war horse right now i mean they're throwing the ball at an absurd rate they're throwing the ball as if they're like the chiefs and and they're not the chiefs but it's fun for Sam Howell and fantasy and and don't look now, Scotty, but it might be fun for our boy Jahan Dotson. I, I'm so glad this is in the binge call. I would have pitched for it too if Colin didn't get there first. Washington is 29th in pass defense DVOA. However you want to measure being able to defend the pass, DVOA is one way to do it. There's other ways to do it. They stink at it. Yeah. <laughs> and when you want totals 44 and a half, it feels light to me. And I, I mm-hmm. realize the Seahawks offense has had stops and starts. Obviously, Baltimore made them look really bad last week. Give Baltimore a lot of credit for that. But it hasn't been a great Geno Smith year. And it makes me nervous when I think about their passing game. But Washington's 
not only a get right defense, but here's the other key part of this, why this game could really be fun is their offense fights back. Their offense matched Philadelphia with points. Howell, the last two weeks, one sack against Philly, three sacks against New England. So that's a big improvement for a guy who's still on pace to take 83 sacks, which would be an NFL record. I believe David uh, Carr is the record, 72, 76, 76 something like that. I think, right, I think 76, 76 sounds right. Yeah. Apollo, uh, Howell's on pace to have 667 pass attempts. McLaurin has popped the last couple of weeks. Dotson is finally free for use again. This just has a look of a game where Howell's going to throw 45 passes, where the Commanders, I think, will score over 20 points. It's going to be a lot of scoring. This game's going to be on the red zone channel every two minutes, and it's going to be like Seahawks 30, Commanders 26. It's going to be a fun fantasy game, and I anybody you're borderline on in the passing games, I say play. Even JSN, I think, is a great bye week fill-in. Jahan Dotson back in the circle of trust. I would play Howell if he was available to me, and Geno Smith, I realize it's hard to trust, but you got to Right off a lot of that game, early clock, mm-hmm. Baltimore. It's going to be Geno Smith's best game of the season because he's never going to get an easier matchup than the Washington pass defense. Yeah, I'm trying to break ties in favor of starting players in this game. For sure. Uh, well said. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, that's a good way to put a bow on it. All right, let's move to the stream category here. Starting with the New Orleans Saints at the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Saints are two and a half point road favorites going into Minnesota, 40 and a half point over under. The Saints are like living in the stream category for me because they're just good enough to have so many potential viable players, but they're just so frustrating and annoying on offense. And like the Taysom Hill stuff is just unstoppable right now. I mean, unbelievable what's going on there. And I, I don't know. I mean, the, the Saints were made for the stream category here, Scott. This is knuckleball against knuckleball. This is Necro against Necro. This is Wakefield against R.A. Dickey. Joshua Dobbs, over 20 fantasy points, four times. Still waiting on you, Trevor Lawrence, to do that once. He's only had one disaster start. That was week one when he helicoptered in to save Arizona. Week one against Washington. Every other week, he's at least been in the top 20, and he's several times been inside the quarterback one cut line because he runs. He's second in the position in rushing yardage. Didn't have the greatest efficiency last week as a passer, but he joined the team 10 seconds before the game. I mean, he didn't know the cadences. He didn't know people's first names. All I want is for him to give some buoyancy to this offense so I can play Hawkinson, so I can play Addison, so I can play Jefferson when he comes back, which you're going to do anyway. But you give the offense a fighting chance. He gives them that. And man, are the Saints a knuckleball. Because when they get near the goal line, no, it's not Kamara and not Jamal Williams, though eventually, because they love him as a blocker so much, they'll give him a kind of a courtesy touchdown. It's not Derek Carr. It's Taysom Hill running, Taysom Hill throwing, Taysom Hill catching his little punt pass kick competition. And that just mucks things up for fantasy, even with people back. Williams is back. Johnson, the tight end, is back. It doesn't matter. This is the Taysom Hill off featured offense at the goal line. And he's the top 10 tight end for the last three weeks. You have to keep using Taysom Hill in props. You have to keep using him in fantasy until it goes wrong. And then somebody eventually will tweet to me and be like, he's not tight end. Blah, blah, blah. It, well, he is in our game. I play the hand they dealt me. They're saying, I can use Taysom Hill at tight end. I'm going to use him. They're saying Joshua Dobbs is a starter. I'm going to use him over a lot of big names this week. And Man, the rushing floor. It's just the way the game is scored. It's the Konami code, Rich Rebar. Joshua Dobbs competes. He's a good athlete. When he does throw the ball, those guys can make plays too. I, 40 and a half is his total. I think that's a mistake. I think this game's going to easily sail past that. Yeah, um, I did not get Josh Dobbs in the spots where I have Jalen Hurts as my starting fantasy quarterback off waiver wires because we're using? excited about him. Ugh, I'm like stuck with Taylor Heineke in a 14 team in the Eckler League, which is a 14 teamer, and I've got to okay. stream a Heineke. Yeah, I mean, gross. Uh, anyways, nobody wants to hear about my fantasy problems. Last thing on this game, Scott. Um, anybody that does media, anybody that does podcasts, we have our like set of lines like that we reuse a lot. I've got a ton. For you've sure. got you've got the one about and you say and I like this you like they're playing like they uh they met five minutes before the game when we do the recap show after the Josh Dobbs performance are you gonna have to retire they they met five minutes before the game because Josh Dobbs and his teammates literally didn't even know each other's names and they went out and won a game oh I loved it that was producer Colin talked about playing football on Thanksgiving that's what that was it felt like okay uh here's my my uncle you know here's my uh here's my sister-in-law you know who can who can block who could run an out route or just everybody go deep whatever it just feels like they're making it up they're right in the dirt i i love it man it was awesome. y- you know we're at a time where in sports where 
optimization has taken over and, you know, NBA, it's all about shooting threes. And in baseball, try to hit a home run or draw a walk and the ball's in, the, in play as often. And in football, it's so much easier to throw the ball now. So a lot of the offenses are copycat. I love teams that have a distinctly different identity. Now, granted, look, I wish I'd do anything to have Kirk Cousins back because that made the Vikings much more fantasy fruitful. But the fact that these two teams are knuckleballers or unlike anybody else in the NFL, that's a feature to me, not a bug. All right, next game up here, Green Bay Packers at Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, Steelers are three-point favorites. The over-under is 38 and a half. Um, I mean, the Steelers, baby, what are you, what are you going to do? They're, they're, they're not that fun to watch. Uh, people don't understand why they're good, but they're good, man. Uh, and they're the much, look, they're the much better team. They're about to, I think they're about to smoke the Packers in this game. One of my favorite stats of this week, Pittsburgh's five and three. They've been outgained in yardage every week of the season, which is just amazing. How do you have five beautiful. wins? Beautiful. Well, how do they have five wins? Well, your know, defense is good. The Browns gave away that Monday night game. Just when you are ready to give up on Kenny Pickett, he makes a play. The find our Deontay Johnson nightmare is over. He finally scored a touchdown. George Pickens has been kind of hot the last couple of weeks. He's a little bit upset. I wonder if that squeaky wheel gets greased. Jalen Warren's making up ground on Najee Harris. Is is it a point now where we rank Warren higher? Or, or maybe if you needed upside, you would like Warren more. I hope people don't. We talked about not having backs on the same teams. I wouldn't want the only worse than one running back of oh. the Steelers is two of them, right? But could you imagine? <laughs> or, or you know, I the baby people out there with Deontay and Pickens. You know, I not that oh, they aren't yeah. both good players, but you don't. You're really oh. hurting your upside there. But this is the yeah, good you're, side. you're gonna have two. Re- you're gonna have two receivers from the same team. But you better have like two receivers. Oh, well, I mean, it hasn't really worked out anywhere this year to have the two no, receiver no. situation. But typically, you want them on a good offense. You do not want them on the Steelers' offense. If I told you you could have two off two receivers on the same team, and there's a couple of obvious ones because Hill and Brown have such high upsides, you don't even care if Waddle and Devonta Smith come for the ride or not because those first guys yeah. are going to do great. And we thought that Puka and Cup would coexist, but then the quarterbacks got hurt, and you know Brett Rippon's not helping anybody. For all the down talk I gave the Steelers, it keeps us from talking about the Packers. Jordan Love makes my eyes hurt. Aaron Jones was a volume play last week. He wasn't great in the efficiency. The receivers, as it seems every week, there's an ex- another excuse for Christian Watson. I realize he has a, a litany of injuries right now. This is a laundry yeah. list of them, so he, he hasn't been healthy. But um, I, li- I like Dobbs a little bit. Yeah, I like Reed a little bit. He made some rookie mistakes last week, but he also had his 21-yard run on a manufactured touch. I'd like to see more of that. Like most Steelers games, the total is in the 30s. You expect this to be you, – you said you think the Steelers are going to win easily. That probably means, what, 20 to 10? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It won't be anything like uh, they're going to get to the 30-point range. That's impossible. Um, but still, I, I think, yeah, I think they win this game pretty easy. Most because I can't give me a running, give me a pit. If you had, if you had to use a Pittsburgh running back for whatever silly things you need to use things for, who would you go with? I mean, I really like want to whisper this as quietly, as quietly as I possibly can. But I think Najee Harris kind of looked good last week. Okay. I I think he kind of looked good last week. Well, you know, I was streaming the game. I could have, I, I, maybe they, there was like a glitch. I didn't see the two plays that he looked good on. You know who won that game for me, by the way? We'll get to him in a minute. We'll love it. I thought we'll love it. Really good. Yeah. Hey, we'll we'll get to them right now because that's the next game up here. Tennessee Titans at, yeah, that's, that's a freaking segue there, Scotty. Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers welcoming the Tennessee Titans. Bucks are one and a half point favorites, 38 and a half over under. This is another one that I could see potentially going Mm. over the total here. Uh, Talk to me about your Will Levis thoughts. I I totally agree. We just had back-to-back games with 38.5 totals, and I feel like the Green Bay-Pittsburgh game, it would be 10-7. I wouldn't be surprised. With Tennessee and Tampa Bay, you might say, well, these are stone under teams. They're going under every week, but both teams, the Titans notoriously a pass funnel, much better in run defense, and part of it by scheme. And You're not going to run on Mike Vrabel. It's like a thing with him. The Buccaneers are better against the run than the pass. It's not as stark as the Titans splits. But the point is this. This game is set up for offense. Levis has been poised. The moment's not too big for him. He had the big connections with Hopkins in his first game. He tried really hard to steal that game from the Steelers. And whatever we want to say about the Steelers' offense, the defense is good. The home field advantage is still good. And Levis almost stole that game last week. They've had extra prep time for this game. 
And you know, Mayfield's been fantasy reliable for like three weeks in a row. They have a pretty concentrated usage tree in Tampa Bay, which means Kate Otten is startable. Evans is startable. I know Godwin's been a little bit frustrating. He's got the unlucky touchdown rate, but he's startable. This game's going to be like 23, 20, 24, 21, something like that. You're going to get more than Vegas is telling you you're going to get in this game. I actually think there's a lot of plausible plays here. I was more impressed with Will Levis on Thursday night than I, and I said this, I think, earlier in the week, that I was more impressed with him on Thursday night against the Steelers than I was when he threw four touchdowns against the Falcons because I think he just showed you a lot of NFL stuff. He threw a pick at the end of the game. You know, you're trying to win. You're, just, you're in negative game script. It's going to happen. Whatever. Who cares? Um, like, I think that Mayfield, it's, it's regressed a little from where it was to start the year when it was like revelation type stuff, what he was doing, but he's still playing pretty well. I, I really do think this game is very interesting. I think Hopkins is 100% in the circle of trust with Will mm-hmm. Levis playing right now. We talked about Kyle Phillips earlier in the week as like a deep, deep sleeper uh, because he played a lot. He's playing from the slot, and the Bucks have just been getting flamed by pa- every passing game, but they've really been getting beat up in the slot. So uh, keep an eye on that one. Maybe he's just a prop bet type of guy this week whenever the whenever the line comes up for him. But yeah, there's a lot of intrigue for me in this, in this game. I, I like it a lot from a fantasy perspective. Final game in the stream category, Denver Broncos at Buffalo Bills. Bills are seven and a half point favorites, 47 over under. This is our uh, Monday night football game here. Scott, the Broncos coming off their bye are no longer a cupcake defense. They played pretty well in the the two Chiefs games. Uh, They obviously won um, the, the game before the bye week. I still am not that interested in their passing game, but uh, how back is Javante Williams, who had a ton of carries before um, going into the bye? Look really good. And the key with the Broncos is divorce yourself from whatever you thought of them after that Miami game. It was They caught Miami yes. on the wrong day. It's hard to play Miami early in the season. They have that great stadium where the other team has to sit in the hot part of the stadium. And the Dolphins are in the cool side of the stadium. What a great design by them. Great, great work, Miami Dolphins. <laughs> So they threw up a 70 burger. It's just, it's a once in a lifetime thing. The Broncos aren't that bad. They're just one of the middling teams of the NFL. And a case for Williams, the Broncos have 16 passing touchdowns, one rushing touchdown. That's the heaviest, as you would expect, the heaviest ratio of pass to run touchdowns in the NFL. And that's at some point that just has to even self out a little bit. And Russell Wilson's been okay. I actually think Cortland Sutton, who uh, Sal Vitri has been talking about as, as a sell, I think he may be a hold because Sutton's mm-hmm. the only guy who makes sense when they need to throw from in close. That's not really Judy's role, and they don't have a, a dominant tight end here. So I think Sutton will still continue to get those red zone and goal line opportunities. But at some point, the Broncos, this ratio is going to balance itself out at least a little bit. There's going to be a little bit of correction here. So it's go time for Javante Williams. It feels like the Bills play all their games standalone they've been thursday night they played in london there's a monday night game here they had a sunday night game with the bengals not that long ago they, they played they played every possible slot you can play and now you're probably telling me they're playing on thanksgiving night or something like that the buffalo bills have become the nfl's tinker toy uh, but they need to show us something they're kind of in danger of not making the playoffs right now Diggs, allen no need no help needed there gabe davis is kind of the touchdown or bust guy We've been talking about Dalton Kincaid. He's great. Play him. He's really a receiver, not a tight end. But I, I even think Shakir is is playable. He's caught all Love 14 it. of his targets the last three weeks. He has the trust of Josh Allen. Maybe he's even kind of getting in Gabe Davis's way a little bit. If I needed to go deep so. at receiver, Sh- Shakir's a name I could plug. I like that. Uh, the Bills do not play on Thanksgiving, uh, but they do have a Saturday game, December 23rd. So. Okay. And then another slot for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, I'm... I'm definitely interested to see if they're – look, they just don't play the Bengals well. Lou Anarumo seems to have Josh Allen's number, mm-hmm, sure. knows how to frustrate him. Um, I, I'm curious to see if they can bounce back in this one. And, like, again, I don't think the, the Broncos are a cupcake, but they're a solid – like, they're they're a beatable opponent, even if they are solid. And, like, I need to see something similar to the offense we got on Thursday. I mean, structurally, it was the same offense. From like a, you're seeing a lot of Shakir, you're seeing a lot of Dalton Kincaid. You need to see that stuff. Structurally, pretty similar offense to what they saw on thir- what we got on Thursday night against the Bucks. I need to see that in like a winning effort here for the Bills. I am really interested to watch this game. It's it's a good standalone game. The rest of the schedule is not a good standalone game. Um, c- and let's get into it now with the skip category, Scott. We've got two games in here that are island games that are in skip. Um, starting with the Indianapolis Colts. 
one and a half point favorites going to New England to take on the pay- or no, not going to New England, going mm. to Germany, Germany. A home game, quote, quote, for uh, the New England Patriots. I just Ron Burgundy the script on that one. Forty three and a half point over under starting on the Colts side. Because they're, this game is really in the skip category for the Patriots. The Colts are actually a fun team, and they're a really fun fantasy team, although I am very personally upset, as I said to you before we started taping, that Josh Downs is banged up. I doubt he plays in this game. There's really been – I'm like I'm, – I'm searching every corner of the internet for a damn Josh Downs injury update, okay? Like, I mean, come on. Well, give, me, give me something. How many games is this guy going to miss? Josh Downs has been one of the best separators in the NFL. Full stop. Not like best rookie separators – Best, like one of the best separators in the NFL right now to start his rookie season. So he's a big loss. But I do think this, like Michael Pittman, I used him as our conviction pick uh, to start the, to, for this week. I think he's a top 10 receiver uh, on the week for me. The Patriots play a ton of single high. Um, we typically see like that lead to targets to the top receiver. That is definitely Michael Pittman, anyways. It'll be Michael Pittman even more with Josh Downs out of the mix. Maybe you could get frisky with like a deep shot to Alec Pierce. I tend to think that's not going to happen with old Gardner Minshew back there. So Michael Pittman, Jonathan Taylor's reemergence, that as the clear-cut RB1, that makes the Colts interesting, but that's about all I got in terms of interesting in this game. Yeah, cosine Pittman. Uh, they passed the baton to JT last week. The, the workload finally went heavy on his side, and Sam Moss is clearly the backup contingency player and, and not somebody. I, I thought – our colleague Kate Majuk made a case of maybe playing Moss last week. I thought it made sense because the matchup was so good, and it was hard to know that the Colts were going to decide. Okay, now we're going to steer into the guy we paid, but they did. That's it, what they did, so we have to f- follow that. If you have to play Demario Douglas. You have my permission. Otherwise, if you want to skip this game again, it's the Germany game. It's the early game. I know for some of the West Coasters, it may be hard to get up on time. I don't think you're missing much if you don't watch this game. Yeah, don't drop Zach Moss. Because uh, if anything ever happened to Jonathan Taylor, you you want him like I got because he's on one of my teams. Like you know, you get those notifications at the top of your teams. Like this player's been dra- dropped in a, all these Yahoo leagues or whatever. And look, I got that for Zach Moss. I'm like yo, yo, don't be dropping Zach Moss. Hang on to him. Uh, you definitely want him, but you probably can't really play him anymore confidently. Um, the good news is that the Colts run so many plays that. There will be weeks if you desperation have to play him that like he could find his way into the end zone. He could find his way into a couple big plays because they just run a ton of plays and they play very fast. But I think the days of him as like a running back too, even with Jonathan Taylor in the mix are, are probably over. I co-sign with everything you said. They also have a run heavy touchdown profile and we know Minshew isn't much of a scrambler. So when they do score, probably Taylor, but it could be Moss too. But Moss, not counting guys who are like in nebulous committees like the Miami guys. Moss is probably the most valuable running back who isn't a starter right now. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Next game up here, Atlanta Falcons, one and a half point favorites going to Arizona to take on the Kyler Murray led Cardinals <laughs> over under is 43 and a half. Scott is shaking his head. Um, so let's, let's table the Falcons for a second and let's talk about the Cardinals. I'm excited about seeing Kyler Murray with this team. Um, and I think they're excited too. I think they are very open to, you know what? Um, Kyle, Kyler Murray is just going to be our quarterback. I think they're open to like right now, if the draft happened today, according to Tankathon, the Cardinals would be the number one overall pick. I think they are very comfortable, Scott, this team. If they, you know, our colleague Charles Robinson kind of um, alluded to this on uh, inside coverage in their, their podcast episode that like if the Cardinals end up picking sixth, or seventh in the draft because Kyler Murray gave him a couple of good moments to end the season. They'd be very happy with that. I think Kyler Murray returning makes Marquise Brown an every week fantasy starter. You heat check me on these. I think he makes Marquise Brown an every week fantasy starter. I think he makes Trey McBride a top 12 tight end potentially. Potentially. When James Conner's back, he's a workhorse. And even like rookie Michael Wilson, I want to stash him because I think he's played well. He's a little banged up right now, but I think Murray would make him very interesting. A yes or no to any of this. I'm halfway there. I like okay. the talents you're mentioning, and I like the narrowness of the usage. But I need to see a good game from Kyler Murray. And I've just been spooked by some quarterbacks who have come back off long layoffs and looked like they've never played football before. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean Kyler Murray can't be good right away, but I, w- I need to see it. So i will happy to happy to roster McBride, but probably wouldn't play him proactively. Brown is somebody you probably have to start based on the composition of your roster. I get it. Even Connor off a long layoff, I 
as soon as he comes back, I feel like he's going to have 20 touches. So maybe that just makes him playable because volume is the story of running backs. But before I tell myself a happy story about the Cardinals, I need to see that Kyler Murray is some version of Kyler Murray that we saw before. I Maybe I'm just letting the Watson stuff spook me, but I, there's been other quarterbacks who've had. It's just a hard position to play. And I know the, the whole Dobbs thing doesn't make sense. And, and part of what he does is just because he's running around and it's schoolyard. That's not – you shouldn't look at that and think, oh, a quarter, somebody was saying somewhere in a podcast, is quarterback even that important? Of course it is. That's just oh, a fluke. That's <laughs> why it's so much fun yeah. because yeah. it's so it's so wacky and so – not to be expected that you can enjoy it for that reason, but I need a prove it game from Kyler Murray. And just sorry on the, on that Josh mm-hmm. Dobbs stuff too. I know like it gets it gets like kind of to be a joke, but the guy is literally a rocket scientist. Like they're probably what like ninety nine percent of NFL quarterbacks couldn't process all that information in real time because they're just like not smart enough. They're not as smart as Josh Dobbs. And I'm not saying those guys are stupid. There's a lot of really smart quarterbacks in the NFL. But from just a pure intelligence perspective, Mm -hmm. that's why it's so cool. Not because, like, any old goofball could have done that. It's that Josh Dobbs did that because, like, he can literally process the information that that Kevin O'Connell is giving him in real time. Like, okay, here's the play call. Read out the play call. Mm -hmm. And, like, now let me explain to you what you just told those guys to do and do all that in real time while the bullets are flying. That's just a credit to Josh Dobbs. I mean, yeah, give me a break. Come on. Counter, counterpoint wasn't Matt Patricia a rocket scientist? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good counterpoint. I, I, look, I, think, I, look, I'm, I think a lot Josh, of people. I'm all for Josh Jobs. I'm all. For, I, I yeah. just I, I wrote in the um, tweet for the sleeper piece, and it's kind of sheepish to put him in sleepers because he's almost at fifty percent rostered. But if loving Josh Jobs is wrong, I don't want to be right. Let's go to Arthur Smith. Let's yeah. give Arthur Smith credit for one thing begrudgingly because you know when, when we start airing our grievances arthur smith's gonna be at the top of the list when we get to that point talk about your fake holidays right December 23rd festivus he's getting production on johnny smith right uh, he's getting he's the secondary guys in atlanta haven't been bad the problem is you spent all this freaking draft capital on guys you have no idea how to use and when people ask you why aren't you using them Arthur Smith doubles down and digs in deeper and says, well, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm Arthur Smith. He's almost trying to spite everybody. Like, I'll show everybody how smart I am by not utilizing guys. His best, his best obvious, easy buttons. And it's going to be – I feel so lucky that I don't have Bijan Robinson shares. It's just the way drafts fell. I, I think I liked him probably about industry average. Yeah. I would have been fine having a bunch of Robinson. I don't, and that was more just the luck of the draw than anything else. This would be forcing me to pull my hair out because there's no reason why they get close to the goal line. They don't want Robinson on the field. They don't want Robinson handling the ball. You drafted him where you drafted him, and everybody thought he was a running back who comes around every five or ten years, and then you use him like he's part of a committee or even a secondary back. It just doesn't make it – I have no – fresh take on this are we at a point we have to rank johnny smith higher than kyle pitts yeah probably i think so um hey i i don't ever like being negative uh on the show but and that's why i hated doing this segment but i did list Bijan robinson as my least favorite first round pick this year um and this was and people hate people hated that take it, at the time and the only reason i did it wasn't because of all this arthur smith weirdness it was that I thought that Tyler Algier was going to be a big factor and it doesn't matter. It doesn't, this is the thing. It does not matter what you think about Bijan Robinson. It matters what Arthur Smith thinks. And he happens to think a little bit different than everybody else. And he clearly loves this guy, Tyler Algier. Like he, he don't put the success rate metrics in front of his face. He thinks he's one of the best goal line backs in the NFL. He's going to continue to get goal line looks period. What's that phrase that when people show you who they are, believe them. Well, yeah, Arthur is, Smith has has yeah. screamed out all year who he is, and and look, I get it. If if out of nowhere Robinson has a blow up game, there's going to be this Twitter victory. See, that's why you stick with talent and you bet on talent and everything. Totally, I, yeah, I, I've given up waiting for that. And the great news, Matt, is now we can pivot to another first round running back who's driving everybody crazy in the next game. Uh, by the way, that was in that same podcast. Dan Titus said his least favorite first round pick was Saquon Barkley, and, and again, people were very very mean to us about that, which is. Why it suck? I hate doing this stuff. It's not fun to talk negative about players, but sometimes- and that's not even who I'm. Te- that's not even who I'm teeing up here. But yes, the oh. Giants and Cowboys. 
Uh, minus 17 for, and a half for the Cowboys. What a huge oh, line. No. 39 and a half total. <laughs> Last week, Matt, I was getting Matt, uh, Matt, I was getting Tony Pollard start sit questions. And you know what's funny? I kept saying, I kept hitting start, start, start. It probably was wrong in every instance. Every The other guy was probably the right answer. By the way, Scott, Tony Pollard wasn't even a first round pick. Okay. Uh, he was like a second round pick, but almost it, every fantasy analyst was like, why is Tony Pollard not a first round pick? Like, yeah. just he should be a first round pick. He should be a first round pick. Easy click in the first round. Easy click in the early second round. Yeah. Disaster pick if you took him in the second round so far. And I, I mean, I just said he's like an is what it is territory. Like, this is probably what it's going to. He's he can easily have a blow up game. Shoot, Tony Pollard could blow up in this game. The Cowboys are seventeen and a half point favorites. The Giants aren't very good. Last time he scored a, last time he scored a touchdown was against these damn New York Giants. But I don't want you to get fooled that like if Tony Pollard does big in this game it's he's going to have big games there's no question he's going to have at least one or two more big games to end the end the season it could be this one i just don't think that's going to happen on a weekly basis a couple of problems here one his efficiency is way down from this year i'm not saying rico Dottle's better than tony pollard but i think it's very interesting that Dottle, yeah. in a limited role has a higher success rate and actually if you need to running back <laughs> sounds is ugly. like tony pollard <laughs> right for sure you know it's not to the it's not to the yeah. level of Tony Pollard. P- Pollard's early seasons were so much fun where Zeke was starting to hit that second phase of his career. And it felt like every time Pollard touched it, he was ripping off splash plays. Dottle is not anywhere near that level. And I'm not trying to suggest it, but running back is gross on the waiver wire. And it, I know these darts miss the board a lot, but you know, big spread garbage times possible. You can squint and see, Oh, Maybe Dottle cleans up and gets seven to 10 touches and maybe a little bit of goal line equity. Garbage time hero totally in play. What's hurting Pollard going forward, not just in this game necessarily, because again, the Giants, they're not even a football team at this point, and they've been really unlucky with injuries, third string quarterback. But the Cowboys have figured something out with their passing game. Lamb yeah. has been unstoppable on the slot. And Jake Ferguson was one of those, all the indicators are good, trust it, trust it, trust it. And I realize it probably took a little bit too long for some of the Ferguson people. They may have cut him or may have not played him in the right weeks, but he's a th- he's their second guy now. Totally. It's not the other rec- – these, these secondary receivers have been disappointments. and They've actually started to use Tolbert a little bit more last week, maybe to their detriment at times because – I don't know why they threw the last pass to Tolbert, but signed Martavis Bryant. <laughs> the best things, the best thing in Dallas right now is Prescott to Lamb, and the second best thing in Dallas right now is Prescott to Jake Ferguson. Yeah, I totally agree. He's he's a clear cut like tight end one, not even like a he'll be in the back half. No, like he's a guy I no want qualifier to start needed. At. Yeah, you got him. You're starting him, man. Yeah, he's a guy I want to start. Shoot, I have one team where I have Travis Kelsey, and like I'm start starting Jake Ferguson in my flex. Because I mean, the rest of my players are a disaster. But tight uh, ends rallied nicely, man. It's yeah, uh, yeah. You know, Schultz has been good lately. Ferguson's been good lately. Musgrave, if you needed to dig deep last week, I, Otten had a couple of touchdowns. He was on the sleeper list. It's Kincaid came around at the right time. It's been it's been a nice rally. The Falcons are supporting two fantasy. No, no, I can't say that with conviction. But anyway, well, it's they're been, supporting one, just not the one you want. Yeah, Trey McBride's um, been good. Yeah, been pretty good. I, I want to see and more Joku, of Rico and Joku hasn't been bad lately. Yeah. No, yeah. He, he's got some interesting usage, but he's he's been involved. I would like to see more of Rico Dowd for the uh for the Cowboys offense. Just get some grinder carries. I think he's a guy once you get past your bye week. Oh, stash, stash him, him now. Just, stash him yeah. right now. Yeah, just just in case like anything happens to Tony Pollard and, and in case they start giving him a little more burn, he becomes weekly standalone value. Um before we move on from this game, Scott, say one sentence about the Giants. Barkley will get 23 touches in this game. Poor, poor bastard. Honestly, I mean, he's going to just get 20, 30 touches every single week for this team. That's going absolutely nowhere. And then they're just going to cast him to probably cast him aside at the end of the year. And he'll be, have been run into the ground. I mean, that's it's awful. The, it's a cruel reality of the NFL. By the way, a lot of times when we recommend pickups, it's like, Oh, he's gone in my league. He's gone in my league. Dowdle is available in 97% of Yahoo right now. So some of you, he may not oh, be three, available. The three percenters are throwing both middle fingers up at the Right, at the yeah. Maybe in the right Eckler now. League, he's rostered, probably on Eckler's team. but um, Or maybe he's playing quarterback for Matt Harmon's team. But no, nah, he's, <laughs> he's available in most leagues. I also want to point out, if you're not watching on YouTube, that Matt's wearing a very sharp East Coast hat today. <laughs> quality, quality lid, Matt. I want to say props for that hat before uh, – I guess we're going to have to talk about the Raiders and Jets, but I wanted to mention the hat first. Felt more important. 
thank you. It is more important. Love a good just random uh random hat. Uh by the way, Rico Dalt is rostered in the Eckler League. He's on Adam Rank's bench. Ah, uh, so. the great Adam Rank. Okay. Yeah. Well, I hope Adam Rank doesn't realize who his starting quarterback is and it gives me a free win this week. So was uh, Rank at your I'll wedding? Say. Was he part of the uh he was. The oh, NFL dude, mafia? He was? Yeah. This is this is just here's how much we really don't want to talk about the uh Jets and Raiders. Great story about Adam Rank, who was at my wedding. Um made a big scene about how he allegedly was the last person invited. Nonsense. Rank is nonsense. My wife's cousin, I ho- he who would love that I'm telling this story. My wife's cousin is is a guy who he likes to enjoy himself. Let's put it that way. He comes <laughs> okay. he, he he comes up to me the day after our wedding and says, "Yo, Matt, like I want you to give me props. Like I really wanted to go up to Adam Rank here throughout the whole time of your wedding and tell him that that mf'er owes me two hundred bucks for some bad fantasy call." And I'm like, Zach, you did do that. Because Adam Rank told me last night that he said, hey, uh, your Breeze cousin came up to me and said, I owe him 200 bucks. That's so, awesome. <laughs> it's like, no, Zach, I hate to tell you, I'm not giving you any props because uh, you did do that. That That is a thing that happened. Uh, so, yeah, that's my Adam Rank story. That's what weddings are for, right? It's just to find yes. people who have cost you money or given you bad fantasy advice. Thankfully, the last time I went to a wedding, my good friend Rod McNeil got married. I guess a year and a half ago, I was actually the best man, which um, oh, poor out. judgment on Rod's part. But otherwise, it was an awesome wedding. But fortunately, I was not fantasy trolled by anybody uh, in attendance. <laughs> I was probably fantasy trolled by somebody at my own wedding. Uh, so there was that. But all right, enough of that. Let's let's waste no more time. Let's finish this. Let's let's land this plane, Scott. Ugh. New York Jets minus one going to Las Vegas to take on the Raiders. I mean, give me the Raiders plus one. Am I am I serious? Uh, Raiders thirty six and a half point over under here. I actually kind of feel bad having the Raiders in the skip category and all the way down here because I'm I'm at least interested to see this Antonio Pierce vibe if this can continue. I mean, they've literally talked about like Antonio Pierce has said, we want to get Josh Jacobs over the century mark. We want to get him. He's the heartbeat of the team, all that stuff. I kind of believe Antonio Pierce when he says that. I'm also curious to see if Devontae Adams is slow streak can come to, come to an end. It's the worst possible matchup. Uh, for Devonte Adams to get right here, but I mean he's too good to be down forever. So, um, uh, put the Jets aside for a second. I feel bad for having the Raiders in the skip category and saving them over an hour talking about my wife's cousin before I talk about the Raiders on this podcast because I do find them intriguing. It may not happen this week, but there are better times ahead for both of these teams because they're both going to steer. Pierce came along at the right time. Everybody had quit on McDaniel's. Garoppolo needed to be benched. Not that O'Connell is necessarily anything great, but they needed to do something different. They needed a new vibe, a new ethos. They have it. Straight out of Compton. It's great. I, I love everything Pierce is saying. And the Raiders, we've seen it before, right? Remember with pit boss Rich Basaccia? He had that nice run. <laughs> yeah. I remember asking a Raider fan, you know, who's even the last coach you liked? He's like, Basaccia. <laughs> you know yeah. Like, yeah. That's, <laughs> how, that's how down bad it's been for Raider coaches. But at least they have some hope now. They're coming off a win. Oh, whatever. You dominated the Giants. Here's a parade for you. But did you see in that game? I know Adams had a quiet game. Still had the big route share, target share, all that stuff. Adams looked happy. Adams looked engaged. And it may not happen this week because the Jets, obviously, they have such great talent to match up with Adams. It'll be fun to watch it. But it's going to happen for Devontae Adams. I would not trade deadlines up. A lot of people might be like, I got to get out of this. If you can get through this week, if this week is not critical to you, you you play Adams, you take what you get, I think he's going to be fine. I think he, he proved in that Lions game, you still get open. Just need somebody to yeah. throw the ball somewhere in his area code. And at least the Jets, I know that Monday game was awful. Zach Wilson's not good. But at least the Jets have identified we have two special talents at offense. Everybody knows who they are. Brees Hall, Garrett Wilson. Let's prioritize those guys. So that's the bottom line. This is this game has like 17-13 or 16-13 written all over it. I get it. But at the end of the year, I think you're going to be like, yeah, you know, I'm glad I rostered the two key Jets, and I'm glad I rostered Jacobs and Adams. At least they came around mm-hmm. in the second half of the season. Maybe they're not going to win your league for you. Maybe they're going to go down as net losses because Aaron Rodgers got hurt and because the Raiders season fell apart. But I still think the arrow for both of these offenses is kind of pointing up. It just may not be this week. Yeah, that's that is so perfectly said. If if Adams doesn't go off in this game, I would try to trade for him before before the trade deadline. For sure. I, I I like that a lot. Just. I think you're right. Those guys will all be net losses because of where they went and the journey thus far. And especially for the Jets guys, like it just is what it is. I mean, I Brees Hall might not go down as a net loss because he went 
with an injury discount, a Dalvin mm-hmm. Cook discount. And so, but yeah, overall, they won't reach the, especially with Adams, is not going to reach the heights of where he was drafted. But I still think there are good days to come for I'm Devon at the point Adams. now with Dalvin Cook, by the way, that when I was perusing free agents for stash oh. value, I don't even want Cook. I, I hate to say it. I just don't think there's anything left with that guy. No, yeah. I mean, they play like Michael Carter in the two-minute drill over Brees Hall, which is frustrating, but it's like a, an indication of where they're at with Dalvin Cook. Real quick, before we end the podcast, you, just because you said the thing about the Raiders head coaches, mm-hmm. it is a bleak recent history of Raiders head coaches. Josh McDaniels, John Gruden, Jack Del Rio, Dennis Allen, Hugh Jackson, Tom Cable, Lane Kiffin. That is a very, like extremely unlike that that, like, that is not a i want to get a beer with group of dudes right there um i mean maybe no yeah no 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 it's not a not a good i and i think in his heart of hearts like i wonder how long like how long did mark davis take to regret not just giving rich Bisaccia the the head coaching gig and and that is why i think if antonio pierce even just has good mm-hmm. vibes the rest of the way he's gonna end up being the raiders head coach well so much from a fi- just from a financial perspective too. Shoot, I mean they are, they sure. are paying. They're still paying Gruden. I think they're still paying. Uh, they're still they're definitely gonna be paying Josh McDaniels for a long time. It's a six year contract. They might only be able to afford Antonio Pierce. Right. I mean, no matter how rich you are, you run out of money at some point. And you can be a head coach. Doesn't always have to be your X's and O's guys. The assistants can do the coaching, and the head coach can be tone, can be face of the franchise. You know, think of the way Dan Campbell coaches, right? I mean, not that he doesn't have input, obviously, in what they do, but he's got a wizard running his offense, you know? And, and, uh, and, and I forget off the top of my head who their defensive coordinator is, but he's doing a great job, too. I really like these strides they've made on defense. The head coach, the CEO head coaching model, I think makes more sense than the X's and O's coaching model. And, and granted, I, I keep giving Ben Johnson a job and everything, and it is certainly – X's and O's head coaches who have worked. Andy Reid is a great example of one. But I prefer the CEO model, and maybe Pierce can be one of those guys. Yeah, some guys are talented to do both, but it's really hard to find. That's a that's like a unicorn guy that you can be the CEO and be the the the, the X's and O's guys. I think Sean McVay has been that, but he's been a For guy sure. that's been burnt out by doing that. So there's a lot that goes into it. But all right, Scott, that was great. Uh, love that love that ending there, and uh, hell of an episode, buddy. Really appreciate it. I'm great, great. We get to talk about Rich Basaccia and your hat, you know, and your wedding and Adam Rank. Also, so much fantasy hockey. We got some great sidebars in this episode, oh, and uh, you know, because look, we I even got to talk a little bit about Tyree Kill and AJ Brown, who aren't playing, man. Because uh, it's I'm going to miss those guys. You're the reception perception guy. I mean, do you believe AJ Brown's six foot one? By the way, every time I watch him play, I'm like, he's six three, six four, right? Look at him high point the ball. He's Crazy. six foot one. That's that can't be right. The Juju Smith Schuster comparisons from his draft profile. That was a fun time. A time. <laughs> right. He, he didn't show swagger against Alabama. Um, I was looking oh, up. God. Um, I was like, look, it, it, it's impossible to do this stuff. Even the smartest people in the room, it, as much as I bash teams for getting picks wrong, it's such a hard job to do it. Even the smartest people are going to make colossal mistakes. But I was looking up some of the Sam Laporta pre draft stuff, and he was compared to Lance Kendricks. My verdict is in. Sam Laporte is going to have a better career than Lance Kendricks. Easy for me to say two months into the season. It's not like I was drafted Laporta left and right before the year, but uh, it's hard, man. It's hard out there. It is hard. Hey, well, that's that's why you come to Scott Pianowski for the sizzling hot takes like Sam Laporte is going to be better than Lance Kendricks here on uh, no, mid early November. All right. On that note. That is going to do it today, folks. A shout out to Scott. Hell of an episode. Be sure to tune in first thing Monday morning to hear that great man, Scott Pianowski, break down all the action from week 10 with me. Until then, we're out. 